What do you say to people who may be listening that just reject this entire category of interest as there's nothing to see here, or there's a reasonable explanation for all of this, or even to go so far as to say, this is just full on demonic and I won't have any part of it. Let me answer the full on demonic thing. Uh, (laughs) Not everything's demonic and you'll be okay. Well, hello there. I'm Cool Gray, and this is Cool Gray in Studio A. Thanks for coming back. I'm glad you're here again. If you're joining me for the first time, then I'm just glad you're here. And I strongly encourage you, as I always do, I never just encourage, I strongly encourage you to go back and check out some of the past episodes. I am having interesting conversations with interesting people. If you met these people at the coffee shop or on the bus or wherever you bump into people that you've never met before. And you learn some of the things that I've learned about these people. I am sure that you would have fascinating conversations too. But since you didn't bump into these people and I did, I'm having those conversations for you. Why not come along for the ride? It's fun. Right now we are in episode 10. You're not that far behind. It's not too late to catch up. Episode 10 is part three of my series on personal paranormal encounters. It is really a fascinating bunch of conversations, and I'm super glad that I have had a chance to have them and bring them to you. My guest today is returning for the second time to this podcast. He was a part of the first series, and now he's going to tell us about some extraordinary experiences that he has had. I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. I got a little bit of business to cover today. Not very much. Couple things. First thing, oh my goodness, this boomer has gotten on TikTok. I've resisted that for so long, but I am there now because I keep learning that it's a great place to promote a podcast. So I'm figuring it out as I go. I could certainly use your help. So if you are over there, look for me as Cool Gray Studios. Please follow and like and check me out over there. There are going to be little excerpts from these episodes. So little tasty tidbits for you to feast on when you're scrolling around over there, but also some behind the scenes stuff and a couple of things from other studios. So some art, some cooking, you never know. I could do anything. I'm going to try to do interesting things. (laughs) Please, please help me out. Um, The other piece of business is that I would love for you to pop over to my website, coolgraystudios.com and click on the podcast menu option and then look for the listener survey that's there. Go ahead and take five minutes to fill that out. If you are the 10th person to correctly and completely complete that survey, you will win a prize. What is that prize? Well, I've mentioned it a couple of times. It is a cup phone holder. It's a $25 value. It'll sit right in the cup holder of your car, and then you can put your smartphone in there, and then you can listen to this podcast. I mean, I'm making it as easy as possible for you people. (laughs) I am clearly in full-on goofball mode today. Not sorry. Part of the reason for that is how excited I am about this episode. So since I don't have any more Patreon commercials to bring you or any other reason to take up your time before we get right to the heart of what we're going to talk about today, let me just introduce you now to my guest. I'd like to welcome back to the podcast uh, one of the guests that was part of our Creativity Born of Trauma series that just wrapped up a little while ago. If you've been with me from the beginning, you have already met Nomar. Uh, If you haven't, and you're just starting here, then you're in for a treat. And I would encourage you to go back and catch up on the past episodes so that you can get to know him in uh, all of the ways that I'm making available to you. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Author Nomar Slevic has been fascinated by all things paranormal since childhood, beginning with a UFO encounter at four years old. Because of that experience, his life's passion has been to research, investigate, write, and share UFO and extraterrestrial encounters from everyday people in a way that conveys the human element of profoundly strange encounters. Some of his works include the books Granite Skies, Otherworldly Encounters, and UFOs Over Maine. His podcast, I Want to Believe, co-hosted with his best friend, Kyle Sawyer, covers a range of paranormal encounters. No more welcome back to the podcast. I'm very glad to have you rejoining. 
Thanks so much for having me again. This time, we get to talk about the meat and potatoes of what you're all about. And I'm really excited to hear about that. In this series, we're uh, covering personal paranormal encounters. So for the most part, I'm interested in hearing about things that you have personally experienced and more importantly, how those experiences have changed your trajectory or your worldview or in any way influenced your life. Certainly, it seems to have influenced your career since Mm -hmm. this is what you do for a living. You write about the paranormal. But let's start all the way back at the tender age of four, when you are saying Mm -hmm. you've had your first UFO encounter. Would you like to tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was born in Fort Kent, Maine. And Fort Kent is right at the tip of Maine. And I could, if I had been older, throw a rock and hit Canada. Uh, That's how close we were. And uh, we lived right across the street from the St. John River. And uh, I was, again, I was about four years old and I had fallen asleep one night, you know, went to bed per usual and something, a loud noise woke me up in the middle of the night. I didn't know what it was. When I think back about it now, it was just a bang. That's all, that's all I can think of what it might be. So I kind of, you know, my eyes popped open and I was searching for a reason why this noise happened. And I was also waiting for it to happen again. And it didn't. Uh, Instead, I started to hear light taps at my window. And so my attention was drawn to the window. And then I saw the sky light up. And I was like, oh, it's a thunder and lightning storm. That must have been thunder that I heard. And with the river right across the street, I wanted to lean up in bed and look out the window and just watch the thunderstorm and see if the river was kind of raging and, you know, to watch the lightning. So I do that for a little while. Everything's normal. I'm hearing thunder. I uh, see little bits of uh, lightning streaks, but it's mostly just the sky kind of lighting up from lightning in the distance. Then out of nowhere, there was this really, lack of a better term, like this obscene lightning bolt, almost as if I were to ask you to draw a lightning bolt and you would draw this jagged yellow line. Wow. And it was stuck in a cloud and there was lightning coming off of it. There were booms and I felt that it was coming from it or around it, you know, like it all seemed to be about this lightning bolt. And I was just fascinated by it because I knew even then at four years old, that lightning you just see in a split second, it doesn't hang around that long. Right. And I don't really know what happened after that. I just fell back asleep because the next thing I remember, I'm waking up in the morning. I wake up and I go to use the bathroom and walking back from the bathroom to my room, you can actually see out my bedroom windows along the hallway. And as I'm walking, I'm just looking out the windows, not even thinking about last night. And the lightning bolt is still there. Oh, in and the it's daylight. Da- and it's da- yeah, and it's daylight. And I'm like, that's crazy. I got to show dad. So I ran downstairs to get my dad. Why we didn't go outside, I don't know. But I brought him back up to my room to show him the lightning bolt that was stuck in a cloud. And when we got up there, it was gone. And so now I'm trying to explain to my dad what it was. And it was a lot of the things that adults do, you know, like pat me on the head and be like, yeah, 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 that's, that's great. And, but I must've been really animated about it. Cause he actually had to like kneel down, get on my level, put his hands on my shoulders and be like, buddy, it, it didn't even rain last night. I'm not sure what you're talking about. And that really threw me for a loop. I wasn't scared. I was, uh, I guess it was the first time that I was confused by something other than some dumb TV show I was watching or whatever happens in my house. You know what I mean? Cause I was four. It, that was kind of like my first worldview of something, you know, and it was just weird, you know, it's uh, a lot to try to process at that age. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not to mention, you know, other stuff that was going on in my life. So fast forward a couple of weeks, 
and I'm getting woken up in the middle of the night. It was the middle of the night to me. It could have been 10 p.m. or it could have been 3 a.m. I, I have no idea. Uh, but my dad's waking me up and next thing I know I'm being dragged like down the stairs, you know, I'm sleepily walking down the stairs and my dad's helping me and I get downstairs and my mom's there. My sister's there. My sister has all of her winter clothes on and I'm like, what's going on? And she's like sleepy and, and, you know, and I'm sure I said something. I remember my mom yelling at me because I must have said something to my sister. And she was like, eh, eh, don't fight. There's something cool going on outside. So my mom's trying to get me, you know, get my jacket and my boots on and everything. So finally, I'm all dressed. My sister's all dressed. My parents have their coats on. And my dad picks me up. And we all walk outside. So my dad's in front holding me. My sister is behind him and my mom's behind my sister. And we go out onto our front porch, which then lead down the stairs. And then there's the lawn. Okay. And then right across is the St. John river. So we get down there and I'm like, what is going on? My face is burning because it's so cold, you know, and I'm like hiding my dad's coat and he keeps telling me to look, look up look. And so I finally open my eyes and look, and I see these crazy ribbons of light happening. They're green. And I think I remember some like reddish blue, something like that, but it was like the sky. I don't know. Um, I've only seen the Northern lights once and it was that night. And I don't know how to describe it. I've seen pictures of it and they look similar, but to see it, at that young age, having witnessed something really weird a couple of weeks ago, also with what I'm dealing with mentally and what's dis- what's initially causing trauma to begin with, all of that's happening. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, wow. and I, re- I remember uh, my mom saying, it's the Northern Lights, it's the Northern Lights. And I had never heard of Aurora Borealis until years later, because I was just I just thought it was called the Northern Lights, you know, I didn't um, know that they could but- be seen in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it isn't that common, but at least a couple times a year, very North. And, uh, but it's actually becoming more and more common now to eat, to see them even where I am in the state, which is crazy uh, and pretty cool, but I've yet to see them because it always happens to be cloudy or something stupid. But anyway, those two incidents happening at such an early age in the sky taught me that I should probably look up and pay attention, you know? So that was the catalyst for like all things strange for me. Was the, was it something that you found yourself thinking about during Mm -hmm. those very young years? Like, do you recall actually thinking about thinking back on those experiences and wondering? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, We uh, living in Northern Maine, uh, for the most part of the year, for a, a, a large percentage of the year, it gets dark out really early. So like coming home from school or coming home from like, uh, you know, having a game or something or being at a friend's house, it was always dark. And it, but it was like five o'clock, you know, in the afternoon. Right. But it was always dark. So I just always remember sitting in uh, the back seat uh, of my dad's car and leaning my head against the window and looking up at the stars, hoping something strange would happen, like what happened before, you know, and uh, some other things did happen, but it was um, uh, mostly like when I was in my bed, you know, I would, uh, I would see some stuff, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it was something I thought back on quite often. And I hadn't heard the term UFO yet. I just, anytime I brought it up, it was the lightning bolt, the lightning bolt that got stuck in the cloud, you know? Are you wanting to elaborate on seeing some stuff or is that something you wanted to skip over? Uh, no, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, I, you know, I just don't think it's paranormal, but maybe it is. I had actually brought it up to some friends, but at night uh, to this day, um, when it's dark, when lights aren't on, I see everything in black and white and it's kind of grainy, like an old television. I've talked to optometrists about it. And they told me it's probably neurological and to maybe look into that. And I never have, um, but in talking to some friends, they too experienced that. Really? And yeah, you know, it's, it's not that common, but it's also, I mean, like a couple million people kind of view the night that way. So when I was young, I just thought that's what everybody, that's how people saw stuff. 
So I would lie in my bed at night and look up at my ceiling and, you know, just a little bit of moonlight or something coming in from the windows and I could see black and white. And if I stared long enough, I don't know if the roof went away and I could see the stars or if I was projecting in my mind that I'm looking at the stars, but I would, the, the, the stars would come into view and then at a focal point, wherever I would look in that focal point, one of the stars would start moving it when it would start making all these geometric shapes, uh, kind of like if you were using a, uh, using an etch-a-sketch really fast, you know, and it was doing all these weird shapes and it, I could make it happen anytime I wanted to. I just needed a dark room and I needed to stare for a little bit, you know, and uh, I just found it fascinating. And I lumped it in with something weird happening above me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or and not even weird, just like interesting, fascinating, whimsical. Yeah, the overarching right? message is look up and keep looking up, no more. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so a yeah. little young to be reading and researching at that point. Uh, but I imagine that when you got through those <clears throat> milestones, <laughs> uh, you actively went looking for reading material that would sure. further your knowledge of these things. Yeah. Can you tell me what those early reading experiences were and how they may have influenced you? Uh, well, it started with Unsolved Mysteries, you know, um, I was young when that show first started and they always like to put in the, the random paranormal episode here and there. And I was watching it one time and they talked about Maine. I'm like, they're talking about my home state. And so I'm sitting there just listening to Robert Stack and He's talking about the Allagash abductions, which were just a couple of hours away from me. And at the time was maybe about a decade earlier, you know, and I was, it was the first time I've ever heard that. I had heard the term UFO and stuff before that, but that's what really kind of put it in my mind that UFOs are a thing and they happen in my state. That's cool. Whoa. How old were you then? Somewhere between eight and 12. I, you know, I'm sure we could find the first air date of that unsolved mystery with the Allagash abductions. And that would probably help me pinpoint, but I want to say it was like 86 or something like that, but I, I I'm not sure. When was your next uh, personal experience? The next major one, because I look up a lot, I see a lot of strange things and it doesn't mean just because it's a UFO, it doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial UFO has become synonymous with extraterrestrial. They're trying to use UAP now, which technically involves a little bit more than just an object, which is kind of cool, but you know, it's still the same thing. So uh, I've seen, I've been staring at something that I thought was hovering uh, for, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden it'll turn and I'm like, oh, it was a helicopter that was heading towards me. And it looked like, a black dot in the sky and then it turned, you know, so there were things like that, but there were also just as many things that it never turned. It just hovered and then blinked out. And, you know, so those are numerous. I think I've seen to this point, 13 UFOs in my lifetime and um, 13 truly unexplained things. I, I don't know what they are. Um, I've seen hundreds of things that I'm not really sure what it was. Uh, some of them did turn out to be helicopters or this or that. Um, some of them I'm like, oh, that could have been A, B, and C, even though I can't confirm it, it could be. So I don't count it, you know, but 13 things that I cannot explain. However, in uh, 2001, I was living in Portland, Maine, which is Maine's largest city. And I was living in an apartment. So this was like the next like major life altering thing that happened paranormal wise uh, of my own experience. I lived in a, uh, it was a house that was converted into apartments and there were four apartments, two downstairs, uh, two downstairs, two upstairs. And I lived in an upstairs one and the roof had an awning, you know, and uh, I had woken up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and uh, to get to the bathroom, I would walk out of my bedroom into the living room, into the kitchen, and then into the bathroom. In the kitchen, there were two big windows that overlooked the awning. And just as I was about to step into the kitchen, 
out on the awning of my roof through the windows, I see this large, I, I see a person basically the silhouette of a person squatting down on the edge of the awning of the roof right next to my apartment. And on their back is a set of wings folded neatly behind them. And they're perched like some sort of gargoyle or something. That's exactly the word that I was thinking. Yeah. Wow. And they were, you know, uh, if it were a person, they were very fit, you know, they were very like skinny, but, uh, but it looked like they were strong too, but it wasn't like bodybuilder muscles. They just looked very fit. And then you, there were these wings, but again, it was just, uh, 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 basically a silhouette, a 3d silhouette of this thing. And I was just about to step into the kitchen and there's a down step into the kitchen from the living room. And so I'm kind of, I got a foot hovering when I see it, you know? And so I'm scared at this point because I, I'm half asleep and I'm clearly not seeing wings. That must be a weird backpack or something. So there's some weird crack addict that's on my roof. And if they see me, they're going to come through my window and get me because it's the middle of the summer and the windows open, you know, there's a screen, but, and I was probably five feet from the window and they were probably three feet from the window on the other side. So it was probably eight feet between us, something like that. So I managed to like hold my balance and then slowly put my foot down onto the carpet, which is in the living room. And as soon as I did that, their head perked, perked back, like their ear was going back to like, they heard me, you know? And I was like, Oh no, no. this thing, this thing heard me. And so it did that that probably lasted five, 10 seconds. And then it stood up and it outstretched its wings and it like smacked like a a major league baseball player throwing a pitch into the catcher's mitt smack when the wings went up and then it jumped and kind of flew down and then up over the railroad tracks that were like behind where I lived. So there was a swoop down and then up and away and I didn't see it anymore. And I was, uh, I was terrified and fascinated all at the same time. And I was in the throes of still working on music and releasing albums, but I was also uh, collecting strange stories. And I hadn't really thought about a book then. I just knew I liked collecting these stories. So I wasn't like, I didn't have a, an investigator's or researcher's mindset. I was just uh, a dude that liked strange stories and I'm having an experience right now, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I, I need to document this. I need to document this. So I wrote everything down and, um, finally went to the bathroom, went back to bed and fell asleep, woke up the next morning. When I woke up the next morning to this day, I can't convince myself that it wasn't a dream. If it was a dream, it was the most realistic, you know, lucid dream I'd ever had in my life and have never had since. Let me, uh, let me, let me grill you about this for a minute. Okay. To fill in the image that I have in my mind, you're saying it's nighttime. Yeah. So the house is dark. Yeah, I'm seeing everything black and white and grainy. You so know, you're in your night it. vision mode. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, but it is dark in the house. Yeah. And it is dark outside. Yeah, but there's moonlight. And so what and you're street, describing, street lights. You're, you're describing it as a 3D silhouette. And are you saying silhouette because it was backlit by the moon? because it was absorbing light what was your impression could you make out any features of any kind or was it just black solid black it it was just solid black but in 3d and uh it was black i assumed at the time and now because it was backlit by the lights of outside but you could see it because there was enough light that created like an outline of it or. um... Yeah. uh, Like um, um, not enough. Like if there was a flashlight on it, it wasn't that much light, but it was enough, you know, to, uh, to, to see it clearly, you know. And you were able to recognize what was on the back as wings. Yeah. Uh, So there must've been enough light to discern that. And um, not texture, but 
there was, you know, the arches of the wings that kind of makes that M on, you know, yep. on uh, the shoulder blades mm-hmm. and they kind of came down. They weren't that wide, but they, they were wider than its waist or whatever, right. because I could, I couldn't see that. And then they narrowed at the end and then flared out like past their hips or whatever, you know, could you discern whether these were like leathery or feathery or what type of wing? Was there any features that you could make out? There were no features I could make out, but I've always had the sense that they were more leathery than feathery just because I couldn't see texture. So that's just what it felt like to me. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Jeepers Creepers for the first time, and I saw the saw him do the wing thing. I'm, yeah. I'm like, that's it. Wow. That's what it looked like, you know. Uh, it, that was obviously much more detailed. But there are like silhouetted shots of him of that creature in Jeepers Creepers, and uh, it, very similar, you know, minus the hat and coat and all that stuff, but very similar. Okay. And so to this day, I want to ask you what you think today. But you're telling me that you're half in the frame of mind that this may have been a dream. I would challenge that. In this way, if you're telling me that you were in your night vision mode, I'm going to just venture a guess that your dreams are not in that black and white. That's true. Uh, Your dreams are probably in vivid technicolor. Yeah. So if you were aware of there not being color present, to me, that would be a clue that you were awake, if only half awake. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And when I woke up, what I had written down was real as well. You know, like I, what I wrote was sitting there on the nightstand, you know, did you look at outside on the roof to see in the morning to see if there was any evidence? Yeah. I went, um, um, uh, I, I opened the window and kind of crawled out halfway. Like I didn't go on the roof. I wasn't sure if it could support my weight. I wasn't, you know, uh, but I went out enough to see, if there was anything in that general vicinity, didn't see anything. There was a few scuff marks, but it was an old house. So, uh, and then I went uh, outside uh, to see if there were any like strange footprints, like around, you know, in case it was standing there and then hopped up or whatever. And then I went to venture out by the railroad tracks that were behind the home. I'd never been out there before. So I'm kind of cutting through some brush and things like that. And as I cut through the brush, my body like hits a chain link fence. And I'm like, Oh, it's fenced off. I I can't even get back there if I wanted to, you know, (laughs) to, to investigate. But a few nights later, I used to be a, uh, a cigarette smoker. And uh, during the summer, I would uh, typically kneel down because that's how low the windows were. I would kneel down, open the screen and like lean out and smoke out that same window uh, where I saw the creature. So I'm doing that one night and I'm hearing Coming down the tracks, I can hear something heavy walking. And, you know, part of it is you, you hear a little bit of step on wood, and then you hear like some gravel and then some wood and some gravel. And, and it feels, it sounds heavy. Along with the, the footsteps are like <laughs> weird robot sounds, like beep, bop, boop, bop. You know, I'm like, what? what am I hearing? And so I lean out to try to look down the railroad tracks, but there's too many trees like right there. I'm like, Oh man. So I flick my cigarette out the window and I close the screen. I run down stairs. I put the cigarette out. Cause that was like a big deal. Like I did not just flick out lit cigarettes anyway. So I put the cigarette out and I run to the chain link fence and I'm looking down and I can't see anything. I don't hear the walk and I don't hear the weird beep boops. I'm like, Oh man, I wonder what the heck that was. That's crazy. And again, it was just a few days after the creature sighting. So anyways, I go back upstairs. It's probably an hour later. I'm like, I'll have another smoke. So I go and lean out the window and I start hearing it again. Beep, pop, boop, but, and then the heavy footsteps and I can hear it walking. Like it's getting closer. I'm like, this is crazy. If I stay, if I just stay here, maybe it'll walk by and finally come to my frame of view. Cause you could see the railroad tracks. Like, I don't know. 50 yards kind of away from me down, down the way a bit. And so I'm waiting for it to come into my field of vision, but all that happens is the footsteps and the beep boop sounds, and it just gets further and further away walking in the direction where I figured I should see it. I don't know what the hell it was, but those are two things that happened really close to at at no point. Did you hear it say danger? Will Robinson? (laughs) No, no, I did not. (laughs) 
So, so do you think those two incidences are connected or what's, uh, what's your thought about that today? Uh, I don't know. They must be, uh, deep down, I say they must be because those were two really strange things. One, I was completely coherent with the other one, not so sure, but they happened within days of each other. And one was profoundly terrifying for a moment. And the other one was whimsical and fascinating. And I can't help but think back to like my first encounters with the Northern lights and some weird lightning bolt UFO. And I got a similar sense of whimsy. And that's when I knew I needed to like write all this stuff down, Mm -hmm. catalog it If for anything else, just historical record. And that's when I started collecting newspaper reports and like keeping them, you know, not just, You know, even my parents would save a cool UFO story if I go visit them or something and they'll show me the newspaper. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And, you know, read it, but not keep it, you know. But since that summer of, uh, of, I think it was 2000. um, Anyway, but since that summer, that's when I really started collecting. and, And that was a bit of a catalyst to 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 make my life's work surrounding the strange, you know. So when we talk about how your personal paranormal encounters changed the trajectory of your life uh, was that documenting that experience the beginning of uh, what would become otherworldly encounters uh no no it was not uh i only told that story in publication like two years ago mm-hmm. um, because i thought it was so weird and um couldn't really trust it and i only wanted to put out what I believed was nonfiction, you know? So uh, I only shared that story a couple of years ago. I find it interesting that these unusual experiences have been a part of your life virtually forever. So there's a certain almost organic acceptance that this is part of reality. There's not a place where you need to suspend your disbelief. It's been normalized for you in Mm -hmm. a very real way. And at the same time, I hear you using a great deal of discernment. You're putting things through uh, analysis and trying to decide this. I I can believe this. I can attach my my belief to this might have been a dream. I'm willing to say There might have been a terrestrial explanation for this, but not this. So there's there's a level of discernment there um, that lends credibility to the stories that you are telling, because in a way they're vetted. I'm wondering how you categorize the entity on the awning. Would you would you put that in the cryptid category or not? And and answering that question, explain to my audience who may not necessarily be the kinds of paranormal enthusiasts that you and I are, what a cryptid is. Sure. Uh, I don't have like a written definition in front of me, but essentially a cryptid is like an unknown or hidden animal that is uh, believed to be real, but hasn't been documented in any uh, scientific sense, you know, a la... Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster or this creature that was on my roof. Right. And have you seen other cryptids in your experience? Yeah. yeah. And this one I knew was real. I was driving. So this was um, February of 2020. So we're like a month before the pandemic. So it feels like 2000 when I, you know, when I saw it, it feels like it was that long ago, but uh, I was driving uh, in Maine. And I was on a road that uh, is about 45 miles an hour. It was about 645, I think, at night. And and it was the road I actually live on, but I was miles away from where I live. Uh, But it's a road that's not very busy. So I'm driving along and about 100, 200 yards up in front of me uh, on the other side of the road, my headlights hit this five to six foot tall uh, bipedal creature that looked like it was made of sticks and uh, to maybe to help imagine it, imagine it better is like the, the Blair witch doll. So you creepy. know, yeah, that's made out of sticks, but it also had sticks on its head, like antlers. It wasn't antlers. It felt like it was sticks as well. Like there was no discernment from its body to what was up there, but there was a clear head. And then 
protuberances above the head and it was really skinny and it was inky oily black like it was shiny black and my headlights hit it for like three or four seconds and when it hit it i saw it take an elongated step over the ditch that's on both sides of the road both sides of the roads but it took a long elongated step over that ditch and walked into the woods so going about 45 miles an hour and only being 100 200 yards away i came up to that spot very quickly so i saw it for like three seconds and saw it walk into the woods now i'm not seen in it anymore but i've stopped my car where i think it walked into and so i stopped the car and it's february so it's cold but i roll the window all the way down because i want to hear if i can hear it walking like the snow crunching beneath it right. whatever it i don't hear anything i don't see anything but like 10 seconds if i after i rode the window down this terrible rotting rotting egg smell filled the car I'd never experienced that before. For your listeners who might not know about cryptozoology, a lot of reports of Bigfoot or dogmen, uh, which is essentially a werewolf that is always in the form of a, a, a werewolf. Uh, people with those types of creatures have reported a real pungent, awful smell. And that's what I experienced for the first time, only time with this creature. And it, it was awful. It was so awful. So I roll my window up and I'm like, whoa, I'm dying because it, it smells so bad. So I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. Now I'm dealing with this pungent smell. So I actually roll all four windows of my vehicle down and drive home the rest of the way with the windows down to try to air out the car, you know? So as soon as I got home, I texted my buddy, Kyle, uh, who's my best buddy. And we do a podcast together your co-host. Yeah. I uh, sent him a message about what happened and told him I'm going to write everything down and I'll also send you that. So I wrote everything down, but now I was writing it down as an experiencer and an investigator researcher. So now I'm writing down what kind of weather it was and the time and how long I saw it and, you know, very detailed explanation uh, about what it was and uh, sent it to him. And then I sent it to uh, a buddy of mine who lives in Tennessee, but used to live in Maine. And he was, uh, or it still is an investigator of all things strange. So I sent the story to him as well. Uh, just so he could kind of have it for his documentation. And, uh, but yeah, that's what happened. So these experiences, and I know we have barely scratched the surface of the things that you personally have experienced. It's led you to down a road where your full-time occupation is writing about these things yeah. and podcasting about these things. So let's talk about the podcast for a minute. You're telling sure. a lot of stories similar to this, not just your own stories. Right. Um, how are you finding these stories uh, that you tell on the podcast? Sure. Uh, it's just like uh, the research I do with my books. I scour uh, the internet, newspapers. Sometimes people will send me stories. Uh, I've signed up to a lot of uh, newsletters or blogs and anytime they publish something new, um, you know, I get an email alert about it. So I'll check out, you know, what's new on their news, paranormal blogs, things like that. And whatever I find interesting that hasn't really gotten a wide audience for, that's what I want to cover. I want to cover stuff that a lot of people haven't heard before. Right. Yeah. So that's basically, it. but we cover everything from black eyed kids to ghost haunted uh, lighthouses uh, to dogman stories, UFO stories, strange abductions, uh, even true crime once in a while, if there's like a supernatural twist to it, you know? And what is the, is it entertainment purposes for the, you know, just you, you use a very narrative storytelling technique yeah. uh, in the podcast. So is it primarily to entertain or are you trying to reach people for other reasons? Um, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a hidden agenda, but I want to provide information in an entertaining manner. So Hopefully I'm reaching somebody who uh, enjoys the paranormal in a passive way. And hopefully they're hearing something that's so engaging that they might seek it out more. And instead of passive, they become more involved within the paranormal. You know, what do you say to people who may be listening that just full on 
reject this entire category of interest yeah. as there's nothing to see here or there's a reasonable explanation for all of this or even to go so far as to say this is just full-on demonic and i won't have any part of it <laughs> um let me answer the full-on demonic thing uh, <laughs> not everything's demonic and you'll be okay um, but some <laughs> so, but some things are so pay attention um, but okay. for people, but for people who don't believe whatsoever, like that's okay. Like I, I still hold love for you. I'm not mad at you. Um, you know, it, it also sometimes, uh, maybe I shouldn't get into this, but sometimes I find that it's weird. You can find both things, uh, within the paranormal, there's a lot of racism and a lot of bigotry. And I've always have been very confused by that because if this you're is so, the first I'm hearing of this, tell me more. Yeah, it's ridiculous. There are uh, organizations I've had to walk away from. There's TV shows that I refuse to go on because I find their television show problematic. Um, there are researchers uh, within the paranormal who have posted publicly their racist and bigoted thoughts. Um, a lot of it surrounding support. Uh, for Donald Trump, things like that. And what do these things have to do with each other? Absolutely nothing. It's. Uh, I have not encountered this myself at all. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's good uh, because it's very disheartening and it'll infiltrate different areas, different corners of the internet. And it's so blatant, blatant now in a lot of areas that there's, uh, I, the only thing I can do is do my best to stay away from it. And whenever I'm writing or doing something in a podcast, I never shy away from showing my support uh, or, or uh, my views that are against that, you know, that's the best way I can combat it, you know? And if there's somebody in my life that that's that way, I cut them out because we can disagree politically. That's cool. We don't have to like the same food. That's cool. But when you start talking about people aren't entitled to basic human rights, because of the color of their skin or sexual preferences, which still makes is so confusing to me. Like, why do people care about that? But if, you know, you're trying to deny people human basic human rights, then we can't, we can't be friends. We, I just don't understand what the springboard is in the context I don't of know. paranormal to even I, begin that discussion. I think it feels like that was a thing in their life and they've brought it into this. For whatever that's, reason. That's a shame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really frustrating and uh, annoying, but it's easy, in my opinion, to kind of navigate around that. It's not like I associate with anybody like that. It's, I always vet people. Like, even when you contacted me, I wanted to make sure, like, I'll check out your Facebook posts and, you know, some things like that, just to see where you stand on certain things. And again, we can disagree politically, but when I start seeing, you know, um, all thugs should be incarcerated, you know, just whatever stupid stuff you see on the internet, mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, that's not somebody I want to associate with, sure. you know? And, yeah. You have to do that if you're going to be engaging on a sure. level like this. Um, yeah, absolutely. Makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Uh, you wrote a book. You wrote a bunch of books, but one <laughs> of the books you wrote was this one. It's called uh, Granite Skies. For right. those of you who are watching on video, I just held that book up because I have the book and I've read the book and I enjoyed the book a great deal. And in that book, you're telling uh, somebody else's personal paranormal experience. And that person is Mike Stevens, who will also be in joining me on an episode of Cool Gray and Studio A as a part of this series. So please stay tuned and hear his story. But having sat face to face with Mike uh, and been told his story for you to write down and document, you were in a room looking into this man's eyes and hearing him tell his tale and you ended up writing a book about it. Clearly, you believe him. Yeah. Um, I want to let him tell his own story, sure. but I'm curious to know uh, what that experience was like for you. Was it uh, affirming, validating? Uh, you, you went on your own emotional journey during that process. Can you talk about it from your side a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it was affirming or anything like that because I already have a belief system. You didn't you know? need to be affirmed. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, and, and just because I have a belief system, I want to add before uh, I also 
uh, in the same breath, I don't believe everything I read, everything I see, everything right. people tell me I'm very, you know, like you we were talking about before I discern quite a bit. Uh, but for Mike, it was very easy to believe. And I love when I can interview somebody in person and I can hear the tone of their voice, see the look in their eye, watch their body mannerisms. And it just tells you so much. And, you know, Mike and I shared um, cries together because of what he'd been through. Wow. Mike, Mike had been through such strange encounters that my brain instinctually immersed myself into it during the interview process. And I'm so thankful that even though I was taking notes, I also had an audio recorder going so I wouldn't miss anything. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, instead of being affirming, it was spellbinding, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. that's a better word for it. And, uh, also he was raw and genuine and didn't shy away from sharing anything, everything goes. And because it was so raw and genuine, I couldn't help, but be the exact same. It didn't feel right. If I wasn't, if I was just this third party observer mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize I was doing it, it was just coming out in the writing, you know, and as I was finishing stories or parts of chapters or full chapters, I would send it to Mike to get his thoughts. And we started to notice that I was interjecting myself, but not in an egotistical way. Right. Just, I became a part of it because of how emotional, what he was telling me was getting me. And I had thought it helped to tell his story, you know? Sure. Uh, yeah. So. And that yeah. was my experience reading it as well. Uh, I sensed your presence in a very direct way, in a way that is not common uh, for you to be as, as aware of the author as right. I was reading it. Uh, and at the same time, absolutely didn't detect a, a hint of ego whatsoever. And I would encourage my readers, if you uh, have an interest in Mike's story as told by Nomar, both of whom are going to be guests on this podcast, it's uh, an easy book to get through. It's a very pleasant read, uh, and it's a fascinating story. Why don't you tell us where that book can be obtained? Sure. You can get that book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kindle if you would prefer to have a Kindle version of it. And you can also get signed copies on my website as well. And uh, you can just do a Google search for Nomar Slavic and Granite Skies, and that book's going to come right up like that. You just choose whatever link feels best for you. <laughs> you know. And there will also be uh, links in the show notes if you want to find him more directly without having to rely on Google. Uh, I do recommend the book personally. I read it and enjoyed it. And that's why I reached out to these two and asked them to be a part of uh, this podcast to begin with. And what about the podcast? Tell us again the name of it and where it can be found. Sure. Uh, it's called I Want to Believe, and uh, it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I've listened to an episode or two of that and have enjoyed it as well. So if you like a good story uh, told in a very soothing, easy to listen to voice, uh, I would definitely recommend you heading over there. But, you know, if you're going to do that, people, please come back here afterwards. I'd yes. love you to continue to listen to this <laughs> podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> No more. I want to thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure getting to know you a little bit better. I would love to spend the rest of this evening sitting here listening to the stories I know I did not give you a chance to tell yet, but we may simply have to do this again on another occasion. Sounds good. I hope you'll consider coming back. Of course. I could listen to Nomar all day long, not just because of his velvety smooth voice. He is so easy to listen to. I just feel calm when I listen to his voice, but he also has a lot of interesting stories to tell. And as I alluded to in our conversation, we just scratched the surface. So I encourage you to check the show notes for all the ways that you can check into No More, get to know him a little bit better as I've been very fortunate to do and um, show him some love. And then, you know, come on back and show me some love. <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm in this for your love. Also, don't forget to pop over to my website, fill out the listener survey and be entered to win a prize. Read the blog I've written that is the companion to this particular episode. There's one for every episode. 
And I've got three more personal paranormal encounter conversations coming up in the very near future. They release every two weeks on Thursdays. So subscribe wherever you listen or watch on the YouTube channel and uh, make sure you don't miss a thing. Today, I have a parting thought for you. Um, I guess you could call it a poem. You know, I'm not a poet and I never really fully understood poetry, but I can appreciate a good message when I hear one. And this one, uh, the credit is to an L.R. Nost, and it's just a message that resonated with me and I would love to share it with you today. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness in the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go. Love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. I mean that. I didn't write it, but I mean it. And so until next time, I would like to say thanks for listening. Come on back and I will see you next time. Cool Gray and Studio A is a fine-tuned services production. It exists for entertainment purposes and is not intended to be used as a sole source of information or advice on any subject. Find and follow this podcast at coolgraystudios.com.